Hydraulic Launch Coasters. Just the name makes you think about, well, hydraulic launch coasters. They're big, they're fast, they're powerful, their numbers are declining, while the numbers of spikes are rising. Today it's time to talk about what makes these hydraulic launch rides work, so let's drop the launch dog and get into it. Now get ready, here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming back and watching another video. I very much appreciate it. I am Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Welcome to the Ryan the Ride Mechanic channel if you're new here. Uh, so today I really wanted to go over something that I've wanted to do for a long time, um, but never just got around to it. So today I really want to talk about what makes hydraulic launch rides work. Uh, these rides are very big, very powerful. They're really extreme machines for sure. They they are at the top of the game when it comes to stress and wear and tear on the assemblies. So it's no real big surprise when parks want to get rid of them because of the extraordinary cost of maintenance on them. But they're some of the most thrilling pieces of equipment to get on out there. Uh, myself, I've been on two hydraulic launch rides. I've been on Let's see, Storm Runner, I believe it is, at Hershey Park, and the original, the Accelerator, down at Knott's Berry Farm in Southern California. So down there, the original was Knott's Berry Farm in Southern California, and I had a friend that was working there at the time, and he was there, there's a video of it out there on the internet, uh, he was there when Sandor, which is the head of Intamin in the U.S., came down and they brought some technicians with them and they wanted to do some testing on the accelerator. So this was interesting because what they were doing was they were checking to see all the math in the system said that it could run bigger, stronger, faster, but they kind of wanted to test it and see could it actually do it because the, uh, the accelerator down there at Knott's wasn't running at full capacity essentially. So they brought some technicians down there, they adjusted the system, they took off, I, I'm imagining they probably took off a bunch of safeties and some governing assemblies, and then they cranked the speed way up. And they basically were looking for a time. They said we had to accelerate the train from point A to point B in X amount of time. And if they got those numbers, they were able to say that, okay, a bigger version of work would work. So what people didn't know at the time was that the bigger version was Top Thrills. So they went out there and they cranked the speed way up on the accelerator and shot that thing over the tower. And my buddy told me, so when Sandor got off the ride, he says, nobody else does that. Nobody else does that. <laughs> uh, so accelerator was the one and then uh, Top Thrills was number two. So what is a hydraulic launch ride? We've gone over some other launch rides, uh, mainly electrical driven, but there are many types of launch rides out there. All of them use the same principle. They grab a hold of the train with something and they use some big steel cables and then the steel cables attach to a drum, a pulley, something, and then it shoots it out the other side. Uh, this, is, this is no different from that. So the components are actually pretty close to each other. We'll talk about the track first. So the track layouts, most of them, um, the accelerator had the, the initial launch plus a top hat, and then it has some high G-force turns around there. And then it turns out when people were pulled afterwards and they said, oh, what'd you like, what'd you not like about the ride? It turns out that everybody loved the launch and nobody cared about the high G-force turns at the end. So it was kind of like, oh, all right, well, if that's really what people want, then there's no reason to go above and beyond and waste the park's money on a bunch of turns all over the place that don't do anything. So I think that was one of the principles for Top Thrills, where it was simply just the launch, the top hat, and the ride was over. Not much to that. Um, some of the tracks, are very compact. 
I would much rather run around a track with a small, tight, compact layout. I love the uh, spaghetti bowl style rides where all the tracks is just shoved into one little tiny, small arena somewhere. It's like, much rather ride on something like that than something big, long, drawn out, maybe super fast like uh, over there at Ferrari World. Um, trains. So the trains for these rides are typically laid out, nice, open, easy to get in and out of. They still have the intimate restrictions on the restraints and stuff like that. So some of them are a little harder to get in than some other ones. But for the most part, they accommodate fairly larger riders. Not too bad. Uh, the construction is the same as most of the other trains. There's nothing really different about these. They put the source of power in the center of the train. So the source of power is that launch dog, which this is a big metal dog, looks kind of like an any rollback that clunk falls out of the train. Um, the launch dog is placed most of the time towards the center of the train. And the reason for that is because you take and put it in the middle of the train and then in front of the launch dog, you have hitches that are under compression. So the compression from all the coaches in front to that launch dog, all those hitches have to take that compression. In the back of that, they have expansion. So all the hitches are basically being pulled apart for all those coaches behind it trying to accelerate with the ride. So typically the launch dogs are put towards the middle of the train or as close to the middle of the train as possible to keep the stress on the hitches down on both sides. So let's talk about what a hydraulic launch roller coaster is. So that's basically a hydraulic system that's running that uses a series of motors wrapped around a large drum to turn the drum which pulls two cables attaches to a catch car and the catch car is linked up to by the train. So train hooks on the catch car, catch car is on the cables, cables on the drum, drums turned by the motor and then the hydraulic system and the ride operates. So uh, what's hydraulic fluid? Well hydraulic fluid is essentially just oil. That's all it is. There's nothing really fancy about it. It's pretty thin when you compare it to motor oil. It's much thinner than motor oil. It's kind of in between motor oil and water in some cases. They sell it in different weights and thicknesses. But, I mean, the simplest thing for hydraulic fluid you have around your house, like a canola oil or vegetable oil, this is pretty much the consistency of hydraulic fluid right here. That's pretty much what it is. Canola oil, vegetable oil, pretty much the same thing. Um, but that's about the thickness, consistency, texture, everything of hydraulic fluid right there. So that is what goes, that's the lifeblood of the system. Let's talk a little bit about hydraulics. So hydraulics are used in places where air can't be efficiently used. So air, we could take a cylinder and pump it up with air pressure, but air compresses a lot. So I'll use this, which is just a little plastic syringe, right? So I, if I pull the plunger back, I filled it up with air. If I put my finger on top of it and push the plunger forward, well, I'm compressing the air now. So now I'm making a higher pressure inside that cylinder to the point where when I uncap it, the pressure comes out. So air is compressible. And where is this? Why, why do we care about compression? Because when I compress the air down like that, that's taking power to compress that air and we're not really getting anything out of it. So we like to use hydraulic fluid. So here's a good example. I'll take two of these syringes, link them up with a plastic tube between them. Now this is pretty much an air system. You can see I push one, hydro one plunger down and the other one comes out, right? We're using air pressure. So I can compress the air and pretty much all the air pressure is just in that little tiny tube right there between it. If I let go of one side, it springs right back out. So let's try the same experiment with hydraulic fluid. There we go. Now there's still a little bit of air in that system, but not much. <clears throat> now I have a hydraulic system. So what's changed? I've taken the air out and replaced it with this fluid. 
how does it act? It still acts the same exact way, right? I take a plunger on this side, push it in, and it pushes the fluid to the other side, okay? Nothing's changed. Same thing, right? But now the deal is, is that I could take those plungers in where before I could compress them, I can't compress them. They're locked now. And now, I can not only push on this side, but I can also pull it back. The two act in unison the whole time. So the power that I'm transmitting to this side push, comes back on this side pretty much 100%. There's almost nothing lost in the system. So if I can generate an extreme amount of power on this side, I could transmit it to this side. So what's that mean? That means that if I take a pump and I produce 1,000 PSI on that pump, which most air systems, you can't get above 150, 200 PSI, but if I could produce 1,000 PSI on one side, I could transmit that 1,000 PSI to the other side. If I used a big piston like this guy and pushed it through a little tiny hole, I could even amplify that pressure to even higher numbers. So hydraulic systems are very powerful, and they're really nothing to be messed around with. A lot of hydraulic systems max out around three or 4,000 PSI. Stuff that's used on rides are up around the 10,000 PSI range, like on boomerangs and stuff like that. And I'm sure the, the Intamin hydraulic launch coasters, they're also closer up to around 10,000 PSI. Let's talk about that big, big hydraulic system down there. And let's see what that does. What I want to do now is kind of sketch out how the hydraulic launch power system works. Uh, this is kind of vague again. It's not, uh, it's not exact to any ride in specific, but this is kind of a general layout. Um, smaller launch rides would have one system like this where you'd have the cable drum here and with the motor array on it and the size of the motors and how many will change per ride. And then some of the bigger ones, this will be the hydraulic piston and the accumulators here. And then the hydraulic pumps down here, about these four down here. So the key thing is, is that a lot of these things will change size, shape, how many are used, depending on the size ride they are. So this is going to be for, let's say, a medium ride. I'm just guessing. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do here is start with our hydraulic power units. That is these four guys down here. Each one of these is a reservoir filled with hydraulic fluid. And then each reservoir is going to get a motor. These are no real specific symbols. I'm just kind of drawing along here. So each one is going to get a motor. And then that is going to turn a pump. We'll do it like this. And this has got a tube sticking down there. So times Now each one of these pumps has a valve that's regulated by the ride. Now all this stuff is typically contained in the package. You don't see much like a, a valving outside of these pump units because one thing about hydraulics is that because of the immense pressure that everything is under, they all stay very close contained all in one tight little spot. And then what you really see around hydraulic rooms are big hoses running everywhere. So each one of these pumps is going to have a return line that basically comes off. So if I draw my line up here, the return line is going to come down here and it's going to go through a valve We'll just kind of like do a makeshift. There we go. That valve, and that's going to come back down into the pump well. Realistically, you don't see that anywhere. So we're going to draw another one there. And then another one here. And then draw this one a little bit differently. Draw that one there. Each one... And what the little arrow is, it means that that is a regulator style valve and it is designed to reduce the pressure. And the arrow, the control, that means you can adjust it up and down. 
that control in this case is going to be handled by the ride. The ride is going to dictate how much it needs. So from here, we are going to take all of these guys and I'm going to run them around. Let's see. We're just going to make it go like this. We're going to make this kind of easy. It's also kind of sloppy. Pardon my drawing for YouTube, which everyone loves. Okay, so now we've got these units hooked up to here. Each one of these units is capable of putting out a tremendous amount of pressure. So we're going to say like this particular unit, let's just say, I mean a high pressure range. So it's good for 10,000 PSI. And each one of those is good for 10,000 PSI. So it can pump up to 10,000 PSI in here. And it's going to take all that and it's going to start charging the hydraulic piston. And we're going to put the fluid inside the piston now. Okay, now on the other side of this piston is nitrogen. And the only reason why nitrogen is really used in most hydraulic stuff is because you can get it up to a very high pressure and it's one of the few gases that when you heat it and cool it, it doesn't really change the pressure that much. So it's very consistent. And then the nitrogen is hooked to these banks of accumulators. The big set of tubes that you see on the hydraulic launch rides are typically in a cluster of four, I noticed. is Those are the accumulators, and all they are is just an empty cylinder. It's just a big tube with nothing in it except for a lot of nitrogen. So we're going to do that times all these here. So what happens is when we turn on these hydraulic pumps, these pumps start turning on and they start building up 10,000 PSI inside of them, each one. So this is times four, one, two, three, four. Now the pressure comes inside of here but the thing is, these nitrogen accumulators, they're going to be charged with the, I'm going to say it's somewhere around the minimum system pressure that the ride needs to run. So we're going to say that on this side of the piston, this being the piston right here, that guy right there. So on the other side of the piston, we're going to put, I'm just guessing here, we're going to put 9,000... 200 PSI inside of here. So when these guys power up to 10,000 PSI, they are going to push the piston this way, and that 10,000 PSI is going to overcome that 9,200 PSI. So what we've done is we've taken all of this, and these cylinders are these cylinders are pretty big. Um, I don't have, again, I don't have experience with one in person, but they look to be roughly 10, 12 inches in diameter times about 15 feet, which is absolutely huge. Uh, so we're going to take the hydraulic fluid in this case, and we're going to push the piston with 10,000 PSI. We're going to push it this way. Now, the reason that they use so many accumulators is because if they're all charged with 9,200 PSI, each one all the way down when this piston has gotten done pushing all of that nitrogen back that way these are probably going to be up closer to about 10,000 PSI once that piston is fully pushed back that way is it all the way up there mm, probably under the system max condition it is but I'm guessing most of the time these guys will probably sit that's 9,200, 10,000 is your absolute max. I would say these things are probably going to be sitting at 9,800 PSI times the rest of them once the piston is pushed all the way back to the end. So we have all the fluid in here has pushed the piston all the way to that side. These guys have all reached their maximum charge and we've got 10,000 PSI. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open 
this bypass right here on each one of these and we're going to start letting that 10,000 PSI or whatever is left if we're only charging the system up to 9,800 PSI. Then we're going to let 200 back into the tank on each one. So by only, at this point in time, we're only putting out 9,800 PSI out of these lines. So that's what's inside the hydraulic side. Now, that is going to change depending on what the ride needs for its load. If it takes an absolute full train and tries to send it over the top and it can't do it, it's going to keep pumping up these hydraulic pressures until it reaches its max. And then at its absolute maximum, which would, let's just say in this case it's 10,000 PSI, at its absolute maximum, if it can't send the train over the top at 10,000 PSI, it's probably going to fault out really bad and say that there's some sort of problem because it's putting in maximum effort which has always worked before and now it's not. So we might have one of these valves might be bypassing internally. Very hard to look for internal bypassing in hydraulic systems but the one thing it does do is it makes them hot. So with a temperature gun you can see if things are bypassing internally because those components will be hot with all that pressure constantly leaking by. So we've Put our nitrogen in, we've put our hydraulic fluid in there, and we've charged it up. Now on the other side, we have all these lines also coming out of here, coming down to these motors. And these lines, from the looks of it, again, just observation, they look like they're going to about every other motor. Not every single one, but about every other one, which means that up there on the motor on each one. Uh, some of them I see more hoses than others, but it probably means each one of these is linked somehow. They've put a manifold between them on the motor assembly, so somehow this motor is getting pressure and it's feeding to this one. They could be daisy chained. There could be a link between them internally, something like that. But either way, it looks like for the majority of cases, it looks like every other motor is getting the pressure and probably transmitting it to these because they're all energized while the ride is running. So now each one of these motors has its own set of valving on it. And that is a variable swash plate, basically. So with the pressure coming up to the motor, these guys go through a valve, and I'll just draw this kind of crude here. Two position valve. When the hydraulic line comes up to it, the valve is capped off. And then when it comes to this side, it passes straight through. That allows the line on the other side to come back down to the variable swash motor. And that's going to look something, not an exact diagram again, but that's going to look something like this. It's got two arrows pointing on it, meaning it can go either way. And then we put a line through it with another two arrows stating that it's variable and it could be controlled either way. So this, the computer controls, the PLC controls this set of arrows. It can turn this one way or the other. And if I rotate the arrow this way, the motors will turn, let's say, counterclockwise. If I rotate the arrow this way, the motor will turn clockwise. So that gives you your direction. And then the great thing about these is that when you put them into neutral, and when you take the pressure away from both sides, the swash plate goes back to neutral. And that allows the system to free spin. It can spin whichever way it wants to. That is a safety feature. That's a great thing. And then on the opposite side of these, all the time, you're going to have the hoses also come down. You know what, I'll use a different color, make it a little easier. All these hoses are gonna come down and they're gonna go back to the tanks. I know what you're thinking. It's like, man, that's, that's kind of messy. It's like, yes, it is. Do you understand now why the hydraulic rooms look like a mess? When you see these pictures and you see videos and it just looks like a squid with a bunch of hoses coming out of it. Now the blue lines represent return. So you have pressure coming in the black lines 
and they're energizing the motors and the blue lines represent once the hydraulic fluid has gone through the motor it comes back out and it goes back into the tanks for these motors to pick them back up and recharge the piston to that maximum pressure. So during operation what happens is that you have these motors control here the system enables the valve turns the swash just slightly and begins to turn the drum and that starts moving that catch wagon back and forth so it will put the catch wagon backwards into position then it moves the swash plate to neutral and while it's sitting there all these pumps are pushing this piston further and further back charging this up tighter and tighter and tighter as the pressure gets higher and higher and higher when the PLC says that's enough I've got my maximum pressure whether it's 10,000 PSI, 9200, 9800, 9500, whatever it might be when the ride says okay I have enough pressure in it then the ride passes control back to the track and structure side at that point in time the track and structure has to wait for is the vehicle in place is the launch dog ready to go down is the catch car in place all those things come back into play so what happens is that everything's happy and it says yes the operator is given the command launch okay so it drops the fins down from underneath the catch car it drops the fins down on the track and then it enables all these motors to be driven and then the ride gives the command and then starts to turn that swash plate into the full bore forward position. All these motors, whether it just be one side like some rides, or like some rides they use two sides worth of motors, all of them turn on and they turn the drum that one direction. And that drum speeds up faster and faster and faster and faster when it packs, passes those proximity sensors along the way. It says, okay, stop. Now, why I'm explaining that <clears throat> is because when the system says stop, if you just shut these valves and put everything back or tried to slow the thing down and said hydraulically, we're going to slow this thing down, you can easily stress those cables out and snap them. Easy. Like that is not hard to do with the system. Now, this is a bit of speculation on my part, but it's a good safety feature. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was 100% this way. But uh, not knowing the intimate hydraulics of that thing, it's more speculation at this point. But again, they're all built different. So. so what I would do is that as I spun this thing up to full speed, I would then, once the train passed that, I would put everything into neutral. You could still build the charge up in these guys, sure. I would slam that valve back shut and then put the, accumul put the swash plates for the drive motors. I would put them into neutral. Not reversed, not forward, not stop, not trying to hold the fluid in one spot. I would put them in neutral and let the whole assembly free spin. So if, if you could, you can essentially walk up to this drum, just grab a hold of it and start turning it one way or the other by hand and it should just rotate. And the reason for that is because the catch car has its own set of magnetic brakes. So once you pass that point, I switch this system into neutral and then let that catch car slam into those magnetic brakes. Then I'm going to use that cable that comes out from behind the catch car. I'm going to call that the return cable. I use that guy to basically catch and slow the entire drum assembly back down to zero. Now, there's also another safety feature. What happens if the launch dog is down when the train comes backwards. Let's say it does a rollback and it comes backwards. If the launch dog is down, it could meet back in with that catch car again. What's my safety? Well, my safety is that this guy, this entire assembly, is in neutral. That's actually my safety at that point in time. Now again, whether that's like this on the ride or not, I am not sure. But this is just me saying from a from a building point of view, I would leave this whole assembly in neutral. That way, if somehow the train hooked back up with the catch car, once it came back down after a rollback, it would just grab this guy and then unspool the entire thing extremely quickly. 
but that's okay. It would probably destroy the cables on there, probably do some damage, yes, but it wouldn't be anywhere near as catastrophic or as bad as if I held the brakes on this guy and locked the hydraulic assembly so it couldn't rotate one way or the other. This way, it would essentially just unspool really fast and the train would be caught by the magnetic brakes on the track and at that point, probably have to take some stuff off, NDT some hitches, NDT the launch dog, maybe do some repair on the catch wagon, the catch car, and then replace all three cables on this guy. But this is essentially how a general launch system works for the hydraulic rides. We've got nitrogen accumulators, push nitrogen pressure on one side of the nitrogen piston, and then we use hydraulic fluid to charge the system up to the correct pressure, which is set by the main valves down here. And then when we're ready, we tell each motor individually to turn and go whichever direction and accelerate. And then at the end, we put it into neutral and let the magnetic brakes slow the entire assembly down safely, quickly, with not much external wear at that point in time. And then once the train goes over the top, we simply change the swash plate direction on the motors and then start to unspool it the other way by using that back cable and again the catch wagon again. We're going to use that back cable and pull it backwards into the other position. Okay, so that was a rough overview of the hydraulic system. Let's talk about the hydraulic pumps and how they work. So let's talk about how a hydraulic motor works versus hydraulic pressure and everything else. Uh, the hydraulic motor, uh, we'll just use the symbol like this, put an M in there for motor, takes hydraulic pressure in, rotates, and then spits waste out of the other side. And that typically goes back to a tank down here like that. So what we do on this guy is we need a lot of pressure to run this because these things typically deal with an extreme amount of torque and there is not so much a curve but there is a line we can use we'll just do this kind of like a school chart here on the bottom we're going to put speed and we're going to go zero miles per hour and then we're going to go out here and we're just going to say I don't know We'll pick something, we'll do pick 100. Pick 100 miles per hour. So that's on the bottom. We'll put some little graduations on there and make it look like we know what we're doing. Although I don't, full disclaimer, right? And then we're going to use two lines on this back side. So here, these are gonna be pressure. And then down here, we're gonna say flow. So we're going to use two different lines here. My pressure, I'm going to use, let's say, the max system pressure. We're going to say this is, let's make up a number again, 10,000 PSI. And that's right there. And my flow, I'm going to say that my flow is going to be whatever the pump can do at its max so let's go with uh, 10 gallons per minute. That'll be max pressure. So as we start off, we have our system charged up fully and we're, our, our pumps are all putting out everything and they're putting out 10,000 PSI. And when we say launch, the system starts discharging all of its pressure and all those accumulators and everything else want that pressure to be consistent, so our pressure slowly starts to drop down. And then as the consumption raises up higher and higher on the motors, our pressure gets lower and lower until it ends right around here. And the cycle stops. Let's, let's say the cycle stops right there. Okay, so that's what happened to our pressure. It came in at 10,000 PSI and it's dropped down. Let's say this is uh, 9,000 PSI like that. During that same time, we have the same thing happening with the flow of the hydraulic system. Down here, 
we have hardly any flow at 10 gallons per minute right there. And the reason is because while this motor is turning extremely slow, we have all the pressure that's needed to spin that hydraulic motor up. So hydraulic motors need a lot of pressure. They don't need a lot of flow. But we need a lot of flow to get up to our final speed. So what happens is that we get another curve going the opposite way. As we go here from 10 gallons per minute, and the curve should be pretty straightforward. Should look like that. And over here at the end, the flow ends up with, we're just going to say this is going to be 30 gallons per minute. So there's how hydraulically your motor consumes energy. As it speeds up, it uses pressure over flow, but then as it gets faster, it needs more flow over pressure. Kind of an interesting concept to grasp a hold of. If you're not familiar with hydraulic systems, they can be quite tricky. But this is the basic thing. And then you have these motors, depending on the system, I mean, you have these motors, about 24 of them wrapped all around those drums in there. So, very impressive. But the hydraulic system's job is to regulate pressure versus flow. And that's one of the things that's so critical about those systems, making sure that they always have enough flow to handle the speed and pressure. That's all those big accumulators, that's all that other stuff that's back there, is to make sure that this happens every single time. Why can't you do this with a normal hydraulic system? Because what we use to do this was made by a pump. This pump, while it's running back there, puts out 10,000 PSI. Very good. Check. Right? And it puts that 10,000 PSI out at 7 gallons per minute. Well, we're not even up to our minimum of 10 gallons per minute. So, how is this going to work? Well, we use these pumps, and we use a bunch of them. Could be times four, might even be times eight. We could use a lot of them. And then we put them in those big accumulators, so that when it's ready, this number is much higher. And the accumulators work even better than that, because they can store all this and the accumulators can deliver us, let's use an average, and let's say the accumulators can put out 9,500 PSI, that's at, and we're going to say 300 gallons per minute. We got that, we got that, we got that. So between our multiple hydraulic pump packages and the accumulators, we can now feed the entire motor array with the correct pressure and flow for both low speed torque startup and high speed in track operation. Hopefully you're enjoying this video. If not, I apologize, but if you are, make sure you like and subscribe and come back and watch more videos. And let me know what you think of this one and some of my other ones. I have plenty in the catalog for you to go out and watch. If you like this sort of stuff, I have tons of it. If you want to talk to me, you can always just comment. And I try to respond to most people in the comments down there. Or if you wanted to email me, you can. You can email me at ryanthereidmechanic at yahoo.com. And I'll try to respond as quickly as possible. So the nitrogen accumulators need some more explanation. That's really where the magic of the system is. And it's mainly like I was talking about, the pumps only produce, let's say, one gallon per minute at 10,000 PSI. So you have to store that 10,000 PSI in an accumulator, right? And then you attach that accumulator to the piston, like this, and then 
you dump it inside that piston and on the other side it pushes the hydraulic fluid out. So you have pneumatic nitrogen pushing on a hydraulic system acting as a cushion to help start and stop the process because the drum requires so much hydraulic fluid that the pumps can't produce it at those pressures. If they wanted to do something like that, instead of using like four to eight pump systems down there, they would have to use like 100 pump systems and link them together. And then the maintenance would be so crazy on those. So they've come up with those nitrogen accumulators on the back side of that piston and they just said, hey, the more nitrogen we dump into there, the higher the pressure is, the more it's going to compress, and then we can set the charge in there. And if, like I said, if we want to run at 9,200 PSI just to get the train up and over empty, then we charge that to 9,200 PSI. And then whatever we pump into that on top of that, the higher up it goes, we can get more and more pressure loaded up into the train. But there has to be a lot of accumulators because you can't have one little accumulator because it runs out as soon as you open that one accumulator it's empty you can't have that so you have to use multiple accumulators so essentially the accumulator gets bigger and bigger and bigger so now you have a bunch of accumulators working together, but sometimes that's not even big enough, so you need bigger. So you start linking those multiple accumulators together to get a consistent nitrogen charge pressure on the opposite side of that piston to deliver the pressure needed to the hydraulic drum. Let's talk about the catch car real quick. The catch car is the long metal beam, basically, that sits inside that little trough down there in the track. Now, it's quite an impressive little assembly because it's about 15 feet long, which is pretty good length. It's lined with magnets on the inside because that's the way it's going to slow down um, on both ends, actually, but it's on the return end, it's more controlled. And then it uses two very big cables, three of them actually, it uses two to pull and one to return. And one's also a um, tensioning assembly as well. So let's talk about the catch wagon and how all the cables get pushed together. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna attempt to build a mock catch wagon assembly, catch car assembly. Uh, basically just out of some little things that I had sitting around the house here. So I found the little guy here. This is this is going to be the catch wagon itself or catch car. Catch car, catch wagon, whatever you want to call it. And then uh, so that's going to be here. I don't have anything to represent the track but we'll just have to set it down here on the desk. And then I have my uh, drum here that this is going to be where the cable wraps around. And then I have my cable here. I don't think any of this is approved from Intamin, so just bear with me. This is kind of like a makeshift. If you want to follow along at home, use a uh, paper towel tube and some string and then piece of something. And then I've got an actual little return wheel here, but uh, its grease is too heavy for this project. So I'm thinking this is just going to get taped to the desk as the return wheel. So the first thing I did is I took my two cables here. These are what would be considered the launch cables. So I took the launch cables and then I poked two holes in the drum. Notice that they're apart from each other, one on each side. Uh, because what they want to do is you want to start out and as the ride starts to speed up, you want these cables to basically spool up the, towards the center. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and wind these guys up. Try to keep it somewhat neat, but these will not stay this way. So we're just going to kind of take it in stride here. Of course, on the actual uh, drums on the rides, there's actually reliefs cut into the drum 
so that the cable stays in its own little valley the entire time. Don't have to worry about it. So I have those cables like that. I'll lay that down here. And now basically I have to attach these to the catch car. And we're going to keep the catch car nice and centered between those two. Take out some tape here. Oh no, I'm going to cover up my writing. Oh well. Probably didn't spell it right anyway. Everyone watching at home is like, we know you didn't spell it right. <laughs> okay, so now what we have is the catch car is now attached to the drum. And now, so if I, if I move the catch car backwards, the drum has to go this way. And if I move it forward, if I turn the drum this way, which is counterclockwise to me, it rolls the catch wagon up. So this would be towards the end of the launch track down near the towers typically on this side. So you have the station towards that side and the towers towards that side. But now what we have to do is we have to put the return wheel in. So I'm going to move this down here and then I'm going to say, hopefully I have enough string to do this. I'm going to say my return wheel, I'm going to put it all the way down there like that. So now I have the return now I'm going to take my return wheel cable, or my return cable, and I'm basically going to put it around the turn wheel, just like that. Now I'm going to have to bind that turn wheel down. I know, a lot of people are going to hate me for this, but whatever. Because I need that not to move. That's what I need. I need that not to move. Still works. That's what I like about plastics. So now I'm going to take my one side and put it on the catch wagon itself. Kind of just like I did before. I'm going to put that right there in the center. Like that. We'll tape this over the side like that. Okay. And now for the other side, well now here's the fun part about the other side. The other side now has to go onto the drum. But it has to be done in such a way to where that they all work together. To where when one set of cables unspools, the other one spools up. Now what they do on the, the actual rides, it's pretty slick. These are very close together, but they take this cable and they wind it. Pretty sure it's the opposite direction here. Let's see if I got this right before I make it permanent, semi-permanent. So now I could take my launch cable now, which is right here, or my, uh, I'm sorry, the return cable, and I'm going to tape that guy down right there and make it official. At home fake roller coaster building at its best. Absolutely. Okay. So now, if you notice, there's my three cables. Okay. Ta da! There it is. So I have my two launch cables with my return cable, which goes around the pulley. So what I have is that now on the ride, everything sits just like it is now. But what they do is they put a pneumatic ram back here and push tension against this cable the entire time. And as you tension that assembly, the whole thing tightens and then the catch wagon starts to lift up. Now if you, if you could see, which you probably can't, I'll use some scissors here. If you could see, the catch wagon actually isn't on the ground right now at all. So, because I'm holding tension on the whole assembly. So, that tension was actually critical on a lot of the testing of these rides because there's been plenty of documentaries and stuff made and they found out that the catch wagon was binding, it was twisting left and right. 
and it was rubbing it was scrubbing too much speed off as it was traveling down the track so they increased this tension and pulled it tighter and then the whole assembly started working together pretty amazing but this is the basic assembly so you could see as I take my drum and I spool the launch cable out which will push the cat which will let the catch wagon just go loose like that well as I'm doing that I'm actually spooling in the return so there we go just like that down at the opposite end of the track sitting there somewhat like this ready to go goes back into position sits there and waits until the train comes along sits on top of the catch wagon drops in the launch dog rolls back puts tension on the catch wagon and then when it's ready the motors all start driving this drum and accelerates the sled down this way now down at the end we hit the eddy current brakes in this end and the sled itself is actually the thing when this hits the brakes this slows way down and these two guys along with the cable back here everything grabs a hold of this drum and slows it way down and makes it go really slow and then brings it to a stop so you don't actually need I'm sure Intamin has some sort of braking system for the drum itself I'm sure it's not hydraulic because that would just snap all the cables if it accidentally locked up so I'm sure they are probably using the eddy current brakes on the launch side to slow the catch wagon down and then on the return side there is some eddy current brakes back here next to where the catch wagon comes to a stop but I don't think that's to slow it down I think that's just there as a precautionary just in case it gets too fast it hits those and slows it back down and the whole system goes into neutral while it does that so it sits there ready for the train to come up get on and then speeds up comes back down this way okay so that's that's basically the three cable system two launch cables and a return cable and the return cable is tensioned towards the back as the launch cables spool up the return cable spools out and then and reverse as the return cable spools up use my spool here like this this might work <laughs> oh boy all right so there we go so you can see that working like that I've seen pictures flying around the internet on these guys and on the actual catch wagon itself there is no pulley or anything underneath here the two cables simply attach to the front the one cable attaches dead center of the rear and underneath it you have two straight runs of magnets that sit underneath there like that that's to slow it down and on the top there's nothing but where the train actually hooks up to which is right here at the very back and the reason is because you want the weight in the back that way the cables lift up the front and then the dog the dogs actually or the catch wagon I'm sorry catch wagon is actually allowed to sit its butt down and hydroplane the entire time it's accelerating and then once the train clears the top gets the command goes backwards in reverse ready for the next one launches back out again so there you go there's some uh, stupid ride mechanic stuff there if you want to build one at home you got the stuff now you know how to do it that's pretty neat right I didn't learn until much later on from one of the engineers that was working on King Daka I didn't learn that uh, I was like oh let's talk about that catch car because I was very fascinated with that does it have wheels on the inside what is that and I said nope it's just got slide plates all the way around and it doesn't actually touch anything on the inside it, it kind of guides here and there but not really I'm like oh what pulls it straight well the two cables 
the launch cables that are holding onto it, they're always fixed over the end and the return cable is fixed in one spot so it can't slide side to side as long as the pressure is being put on it. It's like, hmm, that's interesting. And it just goes down there and then we start talking about errors and faults and stuff and he says there's a lubrication system in that whole launch assembly. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. They get they just uh, pump oil into the cable? What, what kind of lubrication? And he says, no, we use water. Oh, okay, water. I see when the cables run, they fling water off all over the place. Says, yeah, that's because there's water all over the inside of that area. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, so what's the water used for? He said, well, actually, the catch car has no wheels or anything else, like I just said. So it actually slides on the UHMW that's lining the bottom of that launch of that trough it just slides on top of it and i'm like oh okay so the water is used to lubricate it he said kind of it actually hydroplanes on the water so as it's going along it can't compress the water fast enough again it's hydraulic so it can't compress the water fast enough and the water can't get out of the way fast enough so it just rides on a super thin film of water all the way down and it never actually touches the UHMW as it goes down. I thought that was really interesting. I was like, wow. Um, you can search the internet really hard, <laughs> hardcore, and it is very tough to find some pictures of the catch car out of the trough because it's not a normal thing and there's no real good spots visible for it. I still honestly don't know what the cable connections look like. They should just be some big clevises inside there, but I still haven't seen the cables physically connected to those, uh, to that catch wagon, catch car inside the ride. So I would love to see that some sometime. So let's talk about the cables. There are three cables, like you've seen. There are two launch cables, and the cables are about 25, 30 millimeters in diameter and there is one return cable also known as a tensioning cable like you've seen and same diameter on those cables the tensioner is the critical one and that's actually used to align and keep the whole catch car going straight so i guess when there wasn't enough tension on that tensioning cable that the rear end of the catch car would sit there and kind of slide left to right and hit the inside of the trough and bounce off the inside the thing was made to do that, but it was scrubbing too much speed off of. So they, when they tensioned that rear cable and they pulled it back even tighter with that big pneumatic ram underneath the track, um, that guy would just straighten everything up and it stopped digging off the sides and got the rest of its speed back. And then it was able to continue on with their testing as they did when the ride was brand new. So there's a lot of hydraulic motors so when you look at the inside control room, you have the drum. The drum is attached to one, or sometimes, depending on the ride, uh, sometimes two planetary gearboxes. Planetary gearboxes are great at taking a lot of torque and turning it into RPM on the other side. So you could take a motor input and you put 1500 RPM on this side, and then your output side only has about 300 RPM but it'll tear anything apart. It's got so much torque at that 300 RPM because you have all that reduction on the inside. Planetaries are used because they could be very thin. They don't take up a lot of space and they don't need extra transmission. So planetaries and hydraulic systems kind of go hand in hand. Boomerangs and things like that use a lot of them as well. So you have the drum, which is hooked to planetary drive gearboxes. Again, depending on the ride, it's one to two of them and then you have an array of motors. Um, sometimes it's just on the one side, sometimes they're on both sides. Nine-ish to 24-ish motors can be used. I mean, it just it depends on the side of the size of the system and what they decided to use. And then of those motors, those are all connected with small hydraulic lines that are about 40, 50 millimeters in diameter. Those are the pressure lines that go to the motors. And you see that motor looks like a big 
cobweb of uh, hydraulic hoses. So the small ones that you see running along the outsides, those small ones are the ones that actually carry the pressure. The really big tubes that are about, I don't know, about 70 or 80 millimeters in diameter. The really big tubes are the ones that are the return to the tank. So the little tiny ones going along the back side, but you see about eight of them on each piston assembly that comes off of them. Those small ones go up there and they go in and deliver the pressure. And then the pressure goes through the motors and it comes back on those really big lines to vent the tank. And the reason is hydraulic systems, you never want to restrict the flow of hydraulic fluid coming back out. So you always want it to go straight through out like there's nothing in its way. So they use really big lines typically for the return side. The drum on there is also something else that's really interesting. It's about two and a half meters in diameter. So it's three meters in diameter. It's, it's very big, quite huge. And it has grooves cut in it to where the cable needs to lay. The grooves help wind the cable up and down because there's nothing really to do that on its own. So over time, that drum will wear down and those little separations where the grooves are will actually become sharp. I know it was on the boomerang when you had to, when those little separations got sharp, you had to replace the drum because it was essentially at the end of its lifespan. Now there are three attachment points on there for the cable. They have the two launch attachments on the outside and your return, which is in the middle. And you can see that on videos. When the cable comes to a stop, you'll see a rectangular clamp looks like a plate sitting there with a bolt in it and that's actually holding the end of the cable the interesting thing about cables and drums is that once you wrap the cable around the drum about three times around you pretty much can't undo that cable at that point in time like i could take on a boomerang i could wrap it around that drum three maybe four times and then once it's down that last side i can literally hold it there with a zip tie and lift an entire train up with that cable because as the drum turns it that cable tightens more and more and more and more so those initial three to four wraps is where all the clamping pressure is around that to where the actual end of the cable could be barely held on with anything hardly anything at all so talking about the hydraulic motors and how much pressure we could put in the system there's two ways to regulate the pressure of there's an easy way and there's a more complicated but it's less wear and tear so you kind of pick and choose on that one the easy way is to take a hydraulic package and spin it up to its max pressure and then whatever the system doesn't use you put what's called a pressure relief valve in there and you just say hey we want 10,000 or let's see we want uh, the system can generate 10,000 PSI and we want to put 9,000 PSI in there. So the pressure relief valve is set to 9,000 PSI. So that means when that system starts up, it starts pushing the hydraulic fluid through there and that pressure gets higher and higher and higher until it comes to 9,000 PSI. Well, the hydraulic system continues to go to 10,000 PSI, but right there at that relief valve, it opens and then lets the hydraulic fluid go out at 9,000 PSI and go back to the tank. So you're kind of circulating fluid like that. Generates heat. There's some loss there. Um, people would say, well, using a lot of energy in the pump to keep that spun up. But then when the system turns on and it starts to run, then the deal is, is that, okay, well, then your line pressure drops below 9,000 PSI and that valve naturally closes back and puts all the pressure back to the system and continues to recharge it. The more complicated thing to do, but again, less wear and tear on the system, is to put variable pump heads into each hydraulic system. And those like the ones running the big drum, you simply just supply it with a little bit of pressure and a little bit of signal from the rides control system. And you say, tell that swash plate to turn back to zero. And you say, okay, no pressure right now. So you could push the swash plate forward and you could say, yep, yeah, we want a thousand PSI. And then you could push it forward more and you say, we want three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's the more efficient way to do things, uh, but a little more complicated. So I'm, I'm guessing that's probably what the 
hydraulic launch rides, at least some of them probably do, they use variable pressure coming from the pumps. That way when the system's sitting idle, it's only holding the charge in that accumulator inside the piston. It's only trying to keep the charge up in there and it's not trying to put more pressure out there so it's not recirculating the fluid and it's not bypassing, it's not heating up. That makes the most sense. Uh, but those systems are quite complex, very expensive, but rides aren't cheap in general. <laughs> They're not cheap in general. So those were all the parts and pieces of the hydraulic system, kind of general explanations of how they work. There's a lot of pieces, the, the explaining all this is extremely complicated to do because all of these pieces tie in with each other and they kind of overlap and they have multifunction. Uh, one of the things that I didn't touch on back there uh, is the, I've done a video on this before, it's on the side of the track, it's that little rail that sits there, and that's a linear transducer, and that guy is necessary to tell the PLC that the launch dog has actually caught the catch car and is not rolling further back could do it with proximity sensors but I bet they want that position to be very exact to where it said yep we have fully caught the catch car and it's engaged and nothing else not that like it's halfway because the catch car has a pocket like this where the launch dog goes into uh, from my understanding so basically if the launch dog hits the top of the pocket it keeps the train further forward and when it rolls all the way back it gets back to that certain spot those dimensions in the train never change because everything is solid steel placed together so you know when that little spot right there when that reaches x position you could say for sure that that launch dog is fully engaged at that point in time and it's not hanging up on the top or it hasn't rolled past that point. It's a safe programming method to ensure the train's hooked up. All right, so let's see if we can let's see if we can fire this right up theoretically and maybe put all these pieces together to where they work. Okay, so from the control system, first thing you're going to do is head up, turn the control power on, turn everything on, get the e-stops reset, and then you're going to engage the hydraulic system. And then all the pumps back there are going to turn on. You probably have to turn them on one by one, just because they probably want that acknowledgement. Uh, less power draw, too, when you instead of firing all up at the same time. And then you're going to let the system warm up for about 15 to 20 minutes while that fluid sits there and circulates and everything starts to get warm. This stuff cold is no fun pushing through systems because it behaves differently when it's cold versus when it's warm. So we always want hydraulic systems to be nice and warm before we start using them. So once the hydraulic systems have warmed up, at that point we are gonna start to exercise things on the track. We're gonna start raising and lowering the brakes. We're gonna start raising and lowering the catch car brakes. And then at that point I would start to exercise the catch car. Well, I'm not actually exercising the catch car. I am exercising the hydraulic system in general. But one way to do that is probably, again, I haven't worked on this ride in particular, so a little grain of salt here, would be to move the catch wagon from one side of the track to the other and just move it back and forth, back and forth. Sorry about this video, I keep saying catch wagon. I'm so used to saying catch wagon instead of catch car. But the two terms are pretty well interchangeable, right? I think they are. So move the catch car up and down the track, back and forth a bunch of times, and that gets all the motors and everything in the back warmed up, gets it wound up nice and good. Um, I'm guessing during inspection that you would have to do this anyway. You would want to move the catch car to one side to look at, if I moved it all the way to the control room, I can look at the majority of the launch cable wound up on the spool right in front of me and I can see it and I go yep that all looks good look at it from the other side yep you could look for broken strands broken wires things like that this is probably a good time to spray lubricant on the cable common misconception is that the cable is lubricated with water not the case again the water is for the catch wagon or the catch car to hydroplane on it just so happens it gets everything wet 
but cables, you can research it as much as you want to. Cables do not like to be wet. They don't want to be wet. They fail if they get water down on the inside and wipe the lubrication out. So you want to keep the cable lubricated with something like, there's a great cable lubricant out there called Bell Ray. It's oily, it's penetrating, and it's super sticky. So it gets on there and it stays on there. So while that cable is wound up on one end, I would spray that down with some Bell Ray to get that on that cable. Because again, I know there's water all over the place, but I want to keep it out of that cable as much as possible. Then at some point in time, fire the catch car back up, run it back down to the launch position, because when it's back into the launch position in the control room, I can now see the majority of the return cable in there. Now I have nothing on either side because my launch cable spooled all the way out, but I can see the return cable sitting there. Same thing, look for broken strands, wires, spray it down with some Bell Ray, make sure everything looks okay, and then go back, warm it up a couple more times here and there. At that point, probably switch it over into an automatic and then bring the charge up on the accumulators. Now the accumulators, you're not actually affecting their charge like they're already preset with a charge, but as you bring the pressure up on the hydraulic system, it pushes that hydraulic piston further back in there and puts more pressure on those accumulators the further and further back that piston gets. So we're gonna bring the pressure up to its ready pressure, whatever the system may be set at. And at that point in time, I'm ready to take the train that I've already inspected, it's ready to go. And I'm ready to take that train, I'm ready to put it on the track. I pull it back, transfer the train over, put it in the launch side, maybe put it back into the station, depending on how many are coming out there. And then now I'm gonna move the train up into position. The train goes up, it passes all of its proximity sensors on the way, passes everything. And then once it gets to that last proximity sensor, it's told to stop. And then the system is waiting. Now it's waiting, everything is, starts talking to each other. So the system, the train stops, and then what's it say? It says, okay, I'm ready to launch. It says my hydraulic pressure is good, the train's in good position, catch wagons and catch cars in good position. I'm ready to launch. So it waits for the operator to give it the signal. Go ahead and launch. It says, okay. Now, what's it do? It drops the drive wheel down from underneath the train and then drops the brake fins at the same time as well. The train is free at that point in time to do whatever it wants. So also, same time, drive wheel down, brake fins down, launch dog is dropped down. So dog, fins, wheel. At that point in time, the train naturally starts to roll backwards because the launch track is graded uphill. That way in a rollback, it comes right back to that same spot. So the launch dog drops, it starts rolling back, the launch dog catches. The linear transducer on the side has a very narrow little window that that position has to be in. The train rolls back into that position. At the same time, everything's okay still. All the brake fins are monitored to be in a down position. It drops all the brake fins in the launch section, in the launch trough. It drops those brake fins as well. Those are monitored in the down position. The hydraulic system is verified at charge. And once it says everything is good and the train's in the final spot, it says go ahead, open the main valves up, and let's run everything up to its full RPM. So back in the control room, or in the, in the hydraulic room, it takes all the little hydraulic pressure running to each individual motor and starts turning all the swash plates to full forward. And that drum picks up and starts to rotate, gets up faster and faster and faster. And then once the catch wagon passes a certain spot, it tells all those swash plates to go back into neutral. And then right when it goes to neutral, it's not telling it to stop. It's just telling it to go to neutral. Right when the swash plates go to neutral, it hits the brake fins down at the far end. Those brake fins are still up during this process because it's waiting for the catch, the catch car. So when the catch car gets to the far end of the track with the train and hits those brakes, 
those cables now, those ones that were pulling it, are now being used to slow the drum down. And same with the return cable. It's also being used to control and slow everything. So it hits the brakes, slows down. Again, this is just my theory here on this. I believe this entire time that assembly is kept in neutral. Like if you were to walk up to that catch car and grab a hold of it and pull it backwards if you could, because you pretty much can't. You'd have to like come along the thing backwards. But if you were able to pull that thing backwards, then it would just let it go backwards. And I think that would be a good safety for that ride in case, in case your launch dog somehow stayed down and the train rolled backwards. Did a roll back, which is very common in the morning time. First couple launches are failed. So rolls backwards, comes down, and somehow that launch dog bites in and grabs a hold of that thing. Now, if you had told everything to stop and were holding it, it would snap cables and break everything apart. I mean, you're talking catastrophic failure, just everything. But if the system's in neutral, it would still catch the car and it would be a very massive shock to the system. You'd probably still break some stuff, um, but you, that spool would suddenly unwind and it would still be in those brakes. And the brakes for the ride have gone back up at that point in time too. So I feel like that would be keeping the system in neutral is a necessary safety at that point in time. Got nothing to confirm that the system stays in neutral, but that's just my thought of what I think it is. But as the train goes up the tower, once it gets to the top, this is probably after a couple of uh, failed launches in the morning time, it crowns over and flags the proximity sensors on the back side of the top hat. Those are your block reset commands. And then once it hits that block reset, hydraulic system at the bottom is ready to return back to the way it was. So it goes over, up, over the top, and once it crowns over the top, it says, okay, reset the system. So what happens at that point in time? Well, all your brake fins are up. Everything's already up. So it starts to advance the train from that ready position into the launch position. As soon as it starts advancing that train, at the end of the track where the catch wagon is, the catch wagon brake fins go down. And then those hydraulic swash plates back on the motors turn the opposite way now, and the drum starts to go the opposite direction. And then it uses that return cable to pull the catch wagon back down. Once it crosses that end of track proximity sensor, that's midway down the launch track, those brake fins at the other end go up while the catch wagon is going back. While the catch wagon is going back, that other train is advancing into position, and the two kind of meet up close to each other. Most of the time, from the way it looks like, is that the catch wagon beats the train back there and it parks itself before the train gets into its final position and then the system is 100% reset. It's ready to go as soon as the hydraulic charge comes back up on the accumulator. Now, depending on the mathematics from the PLC, at that point in time while it's doing all of this, it's determining what to charge that accumulator back to for the next launch. This is why I'm told if you go from um, really heavy or super heavy loads to nothing at all, you get faults in the system because it goes too fast. Same way if you go from nothing at all to fully loaded trains, it won't make it over the top hat because it hasn't brought those numbers up yet. It's still trying to shoot an empty train. So I'm told on a lot of rides like this, you have to kind of gradually put people on them. And you have to be careful early in the morning because rollbacks are very common. And then if you suddenly get unloaded, overspeeds are very common too. Uh, I know the earlier systems like Top Thrills, they had a manual charge button. So the operator is actually able to see percentage feedback of the machine. And then they were able to actually go through and say, okay, they were able to say like in the morning, first thing, they were shooting the train over empty, 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 and then comes down the line, the first train full of people look really heavy. Well, when that got out there, the person that controlled the launch 
could hold buttons and raise the charge of the accumulator up on purpose. They can overcharge it to where the system said, I'm going to stop, I'm going to bring it up, and I'm going to stop here. And then the operator said, mm, no, train's too heavy. They hold the buttons down. They push that charge up higher and higher and higher. And then there was that window there where they said, yep, now that's going to make it over. So the computer would take that into consideration too and adjust its charge next time accordingly. Man, this has been a long video, even for me. I, I, I hope this is good. I hope people like this. <laughs> Uh, I had high hopes for this video going into it, and I was like, yeah, this is this is going to be great. But honestly, trying to weave everything together with examples and trying to make analogies and stuff, th this was a extremely tough video to do. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Ryan the Ride Mechanic. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and as always, stay off the air gates. Bye.